the next speaker, Dr. Miro Medard, is a H. Green Professor in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department at MIT. She is an HV Fellow, the Editor-in-Chief of HV Journal on Selected Areas in Communications. She was the president of HVE Information Series Society in 2012, and she served on its board of governors for 11 years. Miro has made profound communication, uh, contributions to communications and information theory. She is well known, particularly for her pioneering work on feeding channels and on natural coding. I have the honor to work with Miro for a couple of years, first as a student and first as a visiting student and then as a postdoc. Every time, I'm just impressed by her vision, her passion, and her energy. I can tell you something. So, Muriel can speak four different languages. She received five degrees from MIT, including three bachelor degrees. And her vision and her voice go far beyond the normal range, as you will see. <laughs> yeah, please join me welcome, Muriel. Thank you very much, Jin Feng, uh, it's, uh, for that kind introduction. And uh, at least in terms of uh, frequency, uh, accurate introduction, the rest is very kind. This is a huge honor. Uh, and uh, just as um, Vince said before, it's, it's both great and uh, rather um, overwhelming uh, to be going now. So um, I'm very lucky to have had the other, t the, the other talks before me uh, to set the stage. Um, you, you'll forgive me for the, for, for, for the silly um, uh, reference <laughs> to the matrix, um, but as we'll see, and as very much as we have seen uh, with Shlomo, uh, this is going to be about matrices and reloading them and just considering them differently. Um, I'm this, the, the work I'm going to present uh, in the cases where, I mean, I'm always going to reference it, but I wanted to uh, call out particularly to my collaborators, Jin Fang, Michelle, uh, many of them are here, Andrea, in particular, uh, our late collaborator, Ralph Kutter, who probably would have been here if he had been alive and was very much uh, part of uh, the, the, the story that I'm going to tell. All right, uh, so Shannon gave us a lot of things, as we just all heard. Um, but one of the things I want to talk about, uh, because this will just be the, the, the context for this reloading of the matrix, is the point-to-point -point channel, uh, which, which we saw in the talk by um, Vince uh, and Michelle, which is, in effect, this combination of the source coding and the channel coding with one receiver, one sender. And what happens is the source coding is removing redundancy for efficient storage. Uh, the channel coding is introducing redundancy uh, not out of vice, but for the purpose of uh, allowing redundancy. And there is separation between the two. Um, and what we mean by there is separation, um, we'll see in a minute. But what I want to be talking about uh, in the rest of the talk is going to be sort of growing this matrix in a different, grow, growing from a vector in effect into a bigger matrix, uh, which is to consider the entire network. So what we have is a point-to-point -point, uh, model, and we'll see that this point-to-point -point model in effect, and this was foreshadowed very much in Shlomo's talk, is just a generalization, can just be generalized very readily to a full network. Now, of course, we now live in a network world, right? We've gone way beyond the point-to-point, there's a lot of point to point, but we need to have the network world. And I hope at the end to point out that this network world, as was alluded by some of the talks before, is not just a whole bunch of channels, um, but is also the channels, the storage, the delivery, all of this is a single, uh, a single entity that cannot be teased apart. All right, so principles of coding. So we started out with a very elegant literary uh, allusion to sh uh, shrinking and then stretching, maybe in the same shape, maybe not. We saw a beautiful mathematical representation by Shlomo. So instead of literary allusions and mathematical representations, you're going to get PowerPoint boxes. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> so um, we have data. Uh, we squish it. That's the compression. We stretch it back out, presumably a different way, which is uh, you know, intuitively represented by these different colors. Then bad things happen to my data in my channel. We've seen the mathematical representations of that. Here, you're just going to get a shaded box. 
And then, if we're lucky, we decode back to the orange data, and then if you get to there, then with very high probability, you get back to the original data, although, as we saw before, there may be some, uh, uh, some level of distortion or error or some deleterious effects that cannot be undone. All right, so those are the principles of uh, coding. And what we know, what we know from, uh, from Shannon is that there's separation. That is to say that those two different processes, that of compression and that of channel coding, can be done separately without any loss in throughput. All right, so what does that mean now when I'm looking at a network? So what we saw in, um, uh, f from the very beginning with the capacity formula is that Shannon told us that we can take a channel, which is represented here by a transition probability between the output Y and the input X, and we can replace it with a bit pipe, which is reliable. Almost, basically, that arbitrarily reliable. So um, if you have a network, remember we want to go to a network, and you have a whole bunch of these things, uh, the question, which is a very natural question, is, all right, um, that, that's great, um, but then, then what, you know, if you, you have a whole bunch of these bit pipes? And in particular, going back again to the, to the talk that Vince and Michelle gave, uh, you remember that there was a feedback channel, the fact that, you know, if you have feedback on a point to point, it doesn't, it doesn't help. Now, what happens when you have, uh, what happens when you have a full-blown, um, a full-blown, um, uh, network? Well, it's not clear, um, but one of the things that, uh, you can say, at the very least, and, you know, going back to mentioning Ralph, uh, this is one of the, the last things uh, that we worked on. It was really uh, his idea that um, Michelle in particular and I helped out um, pull together at the end, was this idea that uh, not only could you go in the forward direction, which Shannon had given us, uh, but actually you could go in the backward direction. Now, why would you take a channel that has no errors a perfect pipe and turn it into something that has deleterious effects, you know, at first it looks like you must have gone soft in the head because, you know, that, that was not the point. Uh, the point is you to make things clean and, and error-free, not to start replacing things that had no errors with things that, de that did have errors. Uh, but of course, the reason is that then you can show that no, there's an equivalence, that no matter what happens, what, what sort of channels you've had, you can always have replaced them by pipes, and you, you could replace the pipes with other channels. And then, in fact, what you're saying here is that for any point-to-point -point channels, any point-to-point -point channels, uh, you could always think that whatever you might have done that was very clever, and of course is a massive, massive amount of work. Um, many of the people here are pioneers in the area, uh, in the area of multi-terminal information theory, and you know some of them have been called out, and of course many of them are sitting here, Shlomo, Andrea, Gerhardt, David, I think Tom was here, and you know, uh, many other people, Antonia. Um, Ronaldo, Jerry, and you know Emery, everything with um, uh, going from MIMO broadcast, multiple access, um, uh, Sergio, of course. But you know the, the the point is that while all of these things are difficult and are fundamental, if really my network is just a whole bunch of point-to-point -point channels, which in the end very often we end up either having or pretending that we have out of engineering necessity to simplify what's going on. So you don't keep track of everything that's, that's going on in the multiple access channel at the edge of the network all the way to the interior of the network. That if that's what's going on, then there is, uh, there is this notion of, of separation in effect between the channel coding and the network code. Okay, so, so there is a separation. I don't need to worry about the channel code and the network code, and this goes back a bit to the issue of noisy network coding. That if the noise is noise, it just happens in a point-to-point -point fashion, I don't need to worry about it. So what I have here is then the separation of the network coding and the physical layer coding, which from a engineering point of view is fantastic news because why was it such good news that I had separation before when I had those little boxes of, you know, squishing and then expanding? One of the reasons why it was extremely good news is because, again, from an engineering point of view, the idea that my 80211 card should try to figure out if I'm transmitting pictures of uh, my holidays or I'm transmitting uh, 
a, a MATLAB program. I mean, that's it's just too horrible to, 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 to even try to think about. And therefore, you know, we would have done it probably anyway, even though it was an optimal, so I was going to do it anyway from an engineering point of view. It's sort of nice to have, you know, a mathematical hall pass to tell me that I can't, I can't get away with doing this. So there is a separation. Uh, it doesn't quite extend to multi-terminal uh, channels, but there are bounds, and many people have been working on them. I'll call back uh, to Michelle. I think I saw Shiri in there, Jin Feng, and others. Um, okay, so the matrix. We're going to reload the matrix. Actually, we're not going to reload it, I guess. Well, it's, it's been loaded before by Shlomo and others, so I'm going to load it here. And a much, uh, much simpler uh, version, and this is, um, this is this idea that uh, I have a network, and I'm going to have to represent it. So here I have a network. I have uh, five edges, uh, which we have um, uh, very um, imaginatively called E1 through E5. And the, the network, which is on the left, can be represented on the right by just saying that they're non-zero entries at points where one edge is incident upon another. So you see the edge one here. This is, ah, I'll just point. Edge one is incident upon edge four. Right, edge one is upon edge three. There's a direct hop from edge one to edge three, and the question is there. Okay, how do I represent all the different things that can be going to this network? So, by the way, for point-to-point -point connections for networking for the longest time, uh, why did people not consider coding? Well, they didn't have to consider coding. You know, remember there are no errors, no losses, nothing funny going on here, because the ford falkenstein theorem which is that the minimum cut of the network is the maximum flow, requires no coding. It just doesn't. It's just like a transportation network, and that's why we, we would use it like a transportation network. It's perfectly fine. Uh, now, you can point out that this maximum flow uh, from Fold Ferguson also happens to be um, the rank of the associated matrix for the transfer from the source to the destination. How would you say the transfer from the source to the destination? Well, you could just kind of take your finger and figure out all the paths to get from the source to the destination. Or you could say, well, you have this matrix F. What can I do with this matrix F? I can do nothing. That's the identity. That's always an option. Just stay put. Uh, I can apply it one time, which is one application of F, two times, two steps is F squared, three times F cubed. And you can see what this is. This is just a Taylor series expansion. I minus x is i plus x plus x squared plus et cetera. So it's i minus f inverse, which you can just compute without having to look at the network, without having to do any graph theory. So you're in effect summing path gains. And this allows you then to start proving results, uh, not just for a single source, a single destination, but for a single source and multiple destinations. Okay. And so there was a, there was a, 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 um, a fundamental theorem by Alcivede like uh, uh, Alcivede Li Tsai and Young, who showed that if you had the minimum cut, not just from a single source destination, but from that source to any possible destination, you could do it. There wasn't a construction, but you could do it. And this is a very, the reason why the matrix comes in is to say, OK, how can I prove that? Remember, if I have a single source and single destination, what we have is a matrix as an algebraic form of, of, that, of a vector, of a, of a uh, basically, a vector representation of something that never needed a vector representation, never needed any algebra, called Falkerson. But we can say, OK, I have my A matrix, which represents my inputs. I have three inputs here. I have nine inputs, nine outputs. Each of the three, each of these outputs want all the same three inputs. I have some mass in the middle, which is represented sort of, you know, pudically shaded there, so we can't see just how horrible it is. So we're going to represent it as I minus F inverse. And then I have these three receivers, and you can see that they don't collaborate, right? They have this is block matrix. Each of them is doing its own thing. And the blue receiver is going to be leading to the blue output matrix M, the red receiver to the red, and then the yellow. OK. Each of these individually has to be doable, because you know the fact that I have the red and the yellow can't help my blue. All right. So what do I do? Well, remember, it means that the ford falkerson has to hold, which means that that matrix there has to be invertible, which means that I have to be able to cho choose those betas back here in some way to, to work out so that that's invertible. And it has to be 
that's necessary and sufficient individually for all three for me to do that. The only thing that happens now from having other receivers is that the roots of one of these determinants, the blue determinant, might hit upon the roots of the red determinant. I need to go up in field size. That's it. I could get away with basically a field size of two before. I could get away with bits. I may not be able to get away with bits anymore. Okay, so this is great. You can do all kinds of proofs with crayons, which is a great way to do proofs. <laughs> um, sorry. And, uh, you know, you, you come up with, with crayons and coffee. You come up with something like this. We talked about Slepian Wolf. It basically is an extension of Slepian Wolf to arbitrary networks. You have an arbitrary number of sources, an arbitrary number of receivers. Those sources can be correlated. The same random type of networking um, uh, notions hold. The sources may be correlated. You get something like this, which, you know, Chisor was mentioned, is an effect of Chisor error exponents for Sampin and Wolf. Um, we've mentioned, uh, we've mentioned uh, method of types. This comes from a method of types. So, you know, it's a very traditional information theoretic type of notion. It just happens to be extend it to an entire network. Okay, now if you're an engineer, sorry, you want to see that probably like you want a hole in your head. The nice thing is that this is all you need to do, and I think well, one of the big parts of this talk is, you know, what Shannon gave us is some very elegant mathematics, but really also fantastic principles, not just the separation principle, but some ways of doing things which can be implemented. They're not just beautiful and fundamental, they're practical. So all you're doing is you're taking packets. The packets are a bunch of bits. Remember, bits are not enough. You know, you're not going to get away with binary. You're going to take, you, take your big packet. You're going to chop it up into vectors of you know, eight bits at a time. So you're going to work in f sub 2 to the 8 or whatever you want to do. You can just take something big, just not 2, 2 is not big enough. Uh, multiply them by some coefficient. How are we going to pick the coefficients? Well, remember, all I wanted to do was kind of avoid stepping on somebody else's roots, avoid stepping on the root of the determinant of somebody else's matrix, because that's rude and it doesn't work. So what you do is you just grow the field, right? There are only so many roots to, hold, to, to, um, to step in, and I'm just going to grow the field, and I'm just going to choose them randomly over that field. And that's it, OK? And that's basically where. Uh, Schwartz zippel that we saw right here comes in. Okay, that's what Schwartz zippel just grow the field and off you go. So it's a very simple uh, method. And you know, if you look at codes, it was a fantastic uh, line of coding. This is this is a much simplified. This is the baby version again with uh, you know, with uh, lovely uh, PowerPoint circles this time, not squares. And what you see here is you know going from block codes, convolutional codes, compression. We meant we saw that for zip, just step in wolf. Radeless codes were mentioned. Modern codes, sort of, I'm putting LDPCs in the 90s, even though they were in the 60s, because they were resurrected in the 90s. Um, and, uh, and then network coding is really sort of, if you will, one next step. And of course, I'm leaving out all sorts of things here. All right, so um, what do I do with these IP packets? This is just an, one example of an implementation. This is an implementation in the kernel between IP and the TCP sockets. This is using a, a native TCP socket. So, you know, and this is basically, again, taking these randomness and instantiating. What we're going to do is I'm going to sneak in a little subheader in my IP packet, base, what base I'm working in. Remember, I don't want to work in base two. That was not big enough. But it doesn't have to be huge. How many packets? What are the packets end and begin? And what are the coding coefficients? And with that, um, you can, again, think now of Standard protocols, you know, TCP being kind of the bread and butter of uh, transport protocols. And you can think of it as the matrix. So I told you the matrix was going to come back. Uh, and you have, you know, the things that are decoded. If you're decoding, you basically have an identity matrix. The things that have been seen, that have been received as part of coded packets but have not been decoded yet. And then the unseen things, you know, so there's like the known knowns and all that stuff. Okay. Um, these are some experimental results we've been running in the Pacific, actually, uh, with my collaborators, University of Auckland. Uh, it's a tunnel between Auckland and Rarotonga. I did not know where Rarotonga was either. 
uh, and I've never been there, but we have the measurements. We actually have been running them constantly. And what you see um, is the packet loss in black there and then coded TCP, which is actually a somewhat different version than what I showed you, but it's more complicated to, to, to show. This is implemented in the um, application level. So it's instantiating the full TCP stack in the application level. Um, and going back to this idea of separation, we know that we have separation. It doesn't mean that we want to separate. And here's an example. Suppose that I'm doing something like um, rateless code. Uh, I put in my upfront redundancy. I have three links, one after the other, and I have 10% losses, independent ID losses from each link. Um, basically, if I only code at the ingress, which is what a rateless code would do right now, I'm gonna have to put all the redundancy up front. I could, of course, encode, decode, encode, decode, encode, decode. We know that we can do that from the separation, but we don't have to. We don't have to encode, decode. We'll get the same throughput. I can just keep recoding, because the nice thing about being random and having no structure is that you can keep a lack of structure. It's kind of like having a messy house. You don't have to do a lot of work to keep it in that state. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, here's an example from a multi-help network. This is some DARPA work. We just, here you can see uh, encode the, the losses at the different links, black, red, and blue. The blue one is the worst by far. And here you can see some of the measures with traditional TCP. Uh, just end to encoding, you get the green throughput, uh, the yellow throughput. I want to show that one thing is not just that you're getting more throughput, you're also getting more reliability. You're getting many, many more seconds of actual service. Uh, these are megabit per second. This is one megabit per second nominal uh, rate. Okay, so anyway, building on what Shannon gave us. So separation is a strong principle, uh, but not a requirement. Uh, randomness works. Um, this is certainly another thing that, uh, that Shannon gave us for practically thinking about randomness. If you look at those codes like LDPCs and turbos, they're not random, but they're being random-ish. That's the whole point. That's why they're basically capacity achieving. Um, at least it works when all the data is sought by all sinks. It becomes more complicated when they're not. And I think the other thing that he taught us is that information theory isn't just applicable, it deserves implementation. It's, it's, it's not something that you know, we should be asking for, it's something that's just begging to happen. And one can go from the theorems that look sometimes a little foreboding to just a simple, you know, basically engineering PowerPoint looking thing uh, and do it and then, and then try it out. And, and, it, and it's fun to try it out. I'm gonna put in a shameless plug uh, for the Bull Shannon series of, um, lectures uh, that we've been doing at MIT. This is run by MIT Research Lab for Electronics, where I am, MIT ECS department, where I also am, MIT Physics, where I'm not, but I borrow a lot of their students, uh, University College Cork, where Bull was. Uh, we've had a series of wonderful uh, lectures. Andrea gave one of the lectures. Um, uh, Sergio Verdu, who's gonna, Sergio is gonna give uh, the final lecture in May, and actually Erwin, um, uh, Jacobs just gave uh, the lecture this week. Uh, so I would encourage you to check it out. It might be of interest to, to this Shannon-interested audience. Thank you very much.